So this is the final part of a four part series dedicated to the victims of the Frankston serial killer. If you missed the first three parts, they're all linked below and we talk about each of the victims. And in this part, we identify the killer. So let's get straight into it. So police went to Paul Denny's home, but no one was there, so they left a card asking him to call the Frankston police station. At 5.15pm, Sharon Johnson, Paul's girlfriend, phoned the police to inform them that she had found their card. A group of officers immediately drove to the house, and upon arrival were met by Sharon and Paul. Officers asked Paul a few questions, like if he had a job, and he confirmed that he was jobless and had been for a few months. They asked him what he'd done the previous day, and Paul went through all the details. He said that he got up at around 7.30am that day, and then dropped his girlfriend at work at 8.45. Paul then went to an ATM in Seaford and took out $40. He then drove to a car wreckers and believed he arrived there at around 10 a.m. He was looking for a spare wheel for his car and he purchased one. He then drove back home at 11 a.m. He said that he worked on his car at home for a little bit and then went to another car wreckers in Lang Warren to find a speedo cable. Paul said that on his way his car overheated. Because of this he had to pull over and top up the water. He then waited a little while for the car to cool down so he smoked a cigarette and went for a short walk around the general area. He decided to head home but then his car overheated again. Again. He had to pull over a second time, but this time he pulled over next to the golf course. He claimed that he didn't have any water left to add to the car, and he didn't want to ask any of the neighbors in the area for water. So he decided to walk home, which was 20 minutes away, to get more water and then walk back to the car. Denya said that he returned to the car between 3.30 and 4 p.m. that day. Later in the afternoon, he then picked up his girlfriend Sharon from work, and then in the evening, the pair drove to Sharon's mum's house. They got there at around 7 p.m. and stayed until just before midnight. While Denya was explaining his whereabouts the previous day, the police officers noticed cuts all over his hand. When officers asked him how he got the cuts, Denya said he got them while working on his car and while collecting parts of the wreckers. The police officers asked Denya to go with them to the Frankston police station to undergo further questioning. Denya agreed to go with them and at 6.20pm, Denya and the two officers drove to the police station to begin the formal interview. The interview would continue all night long and into the next morning. It wasn't long before officers knew that they had the right man. This was the man that had been murdering young women in and around Frankston. A camera was set up in the interview room so there was a video recording of the questioning. Police also noticed a piece of skin missing from Denia's middle finger. This was instantly thought to be connected to the piece of skin that was found on Natalie Russell's neck. In the interview Denia stated that he was 21 years old and was born on the 14th of April 1972. Police started by questioning Denia about his movements on the previous day. This time they asked a lot of questions to get a very detailed timeline but Denia's timeline just wasn't adding up or making any sense so police kept pushing further questions. The officer then asked Denya if he was aware that a girl had been murdered the previous day. Denya said that he was aware. The officer asked more and more questions of Denya going around in circles with Denya making statements and then recanting them as they didn't make sense. The officer eventually moved on to questioning Denya about Debbie Frame's murder. He started by asking Denya what he knew of Debbie's murder. Denya said that he saw a lot of reports in the media about the case. The officer then asked Denya what he was doing the night of Debbie's murder and Denya was able to remember straight away. He remembered every detail of what he did that night even though it was weeks earlier. After going through Denia's account of his whereabouts on the night of Debbie Frame's murder, the officer then asked if he was aware of the murder of Elizabeth Stevens. He confirmed that he was. The officer then asked him what he was doing the day of Elizabeth's murder and again, Denia had a full explanation of what he did that day. He claimed that he walked three kilometers in the dark to his mum's place to see if a car battery was there, that he'd left near the rubbish bins at her house a year and a half earlier. When he got there, he checked the front yard, but it was gone. He didn't bother knocking on the door or checking anywhere else, Instead, he just left. This didn't make any sense at all, but it put him within 15 minutes of Lloyd Park where Elizabeth's body was found. So by this point, it was discovered that Denya had been near the three murder locations when all three women were murdered. His car was parked near the bike track where Natalie was murdered. He was walking around the streets of Cannonook Station the night that Debbie Frame was murdered and he was walking in the vicinity of Lloyd Park the night that Elizabeth Stevens was murdered. At 11.25 p.m., they stopped the interview and had a break. When officers returned to the interview room, they requested a sample of Denya's blood. They informed Denya that he could refuse, but if he did, they would apply for an order from the magistrate and then Denya wouldn't have a choice. So Denya agreed to give a sample of blood. He also agreed to give his fingerprints and a sample of hair. Denya then asked if he could go to the toilet and one of the detectives went with him. On the way back to the interview room, Denya started asking questions. He said, can you tell me something off the record? How long do DNA tests take? Have they got something to DNA because they've asked for my blood and stuff? When they get the blood, will the DNA match? And then all of a sudden, Paul looked at the detective and said, okay, I killed all three of them. The detective was caught off guard and informed 
informed Denia that he needed to go and get the senior sergeant and then Denia said, you might as well tell them that I attacked another woman at Seaford the night that Debbie Frame was killed. At 3.45 a.m., Denia confessed to all three murders. He started by confessing to the murder of Elizabeth Stevens. When asked why he did it, Denia said that he felt his life had been taken away from him many times, so he wanted to take a life. When he was asked to elaborate, Denia admitted that his eldest brother, David, abused him sexually when he was younger. He informed detectives that after he murdered Elizabeth, he went home, ate dinner, which was soup and roast, and then waited for his partner, Sharon, to come home. Then he went on to confess about attacking Rosa Toth. The detectives asked what his intentions were with Rosa, and he said, I was just gonna drag her in the park and kill her, that's all. Once Rosa had got away from Denia, he got on the train to Cannonook Station. He then walked to the milk bar and admitted that he had a feeling to kill. He walked up to a car in the parking lot of the milk bar and checked to see if the driver door was unlocked. He got in the car and crouched down on the back seat. He said that when Debbie got in the car, he made her drive to a secluded location and then he murdered her. When detectives asked why he did it, he replied with, same reason why I killed Elizabeth Stevens, I just wanted to. He then admitted to murdering Natalie Russell by cutting her throat in the golf course. He said that he killed her for the same reason as he killed the other women and he kicked her body before he left. The detective asked Denia when he first began to feel the urge to kill. Denia said that he had always wanted to and he distinctly remembers the urges starting from as early as 14 years old. He said that he had been stalking women in Frankston since he was 17. He would follow women around and he was just waiting for the right opportunity and a strong enough urge to follow through with the murder. Detectives asked Denia why all the victims were women and Denia said, I just hate them. The detective asked Denia if he hated the particular women he murdered or all women in general. And Denia admitted to all women in general. He said that his girlfriend Sharon was different though. She was unlike anyone that Denia had ever met. On Wednesday the 15th of December 1993, Paul Denia faced court and pleaded guilty to all three murders as well as the abduction of Rosa Toth. It was reported that Denia didn't show any remorse to any of his victims. He instead appeared to enjoy talking about his crimes. He also said that there was various factors that contributed to his urge to kill. This included his brother's alleged sexual assault and the fact that he was often unemployed and struggled to get a job. Paul was sentenced to life in prison for each of the murders, plus an additional eight years for the attempted abduction of Rosa. The sentences would run concurrently and Paul would never be eligible for parole. But a few months later, a solicitor lodged an appeal saying that the sentence of Denia was excessive and it needed to be reconsidered with a minimum sentence in place so one day Denia could be eligible for parole. In July of 1994, the appeal case went to the Supreme Court and Denia was granted a 30-year non-parole period, which meant that Denia was eligible for parole in 2023 as it was 30 years from his original sentence date. A lot of people were very angry about this decision as it was basically a sentence of 10 years per victim. Then in 2004, Denia came back into the spotlight after he revealed that he wanted to become a woman. In prison, he started plucking his eyebrows, straightening his hair, shaving his legs and wearing makeup including mascara, eyeliner and lip gloss. He demanded to be called Paula and would only respond to that name. He also wanted to undertake sex change surgery. He then changed his story to say that he actually killed the women because he didn't feel like a man. Make it make sense. Some think he did this in hopes that he would be released from prison when he was eligible for parole. However, Denia did go back to being a man and being called Paul. Then in May of 2023, Denia was eligible for parole, but he was denied. However, in the coming years, Denia will be eligible to apply for parole again. Denia has moved prisons a few times, but he is currently in Port Phillip Prison in Melbourne's western suburbs.